foundational to everything that we are going to be doing in statistics is your ability to distinguish between the levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, which I'm going to abbreviate as NOIR. The levels of measurement indicate the job that the number is doing. You see, numbers can do three jobs. A number can stand in for a name. If I want to know which one, which player was downfield on the pass, it was number 23. That number is standing in for the name of the player. Numbers can indicate an order. Who's on first? Who is first, second, or third place? And numbers can quantify or count. How many siblings do you have? How much does it cost for a coffee at the student union? I said that there are three jobs, but there are four levels of measurement nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So let's sort out those levels of measurement to determine which job each level of measurement is doing. We're gonna begin with nominal level data. Nominal data are numbers that are used to name, or label, or identify. The number in nominal data simply indicates a difference. Nominal data could be numeric, such as using one for Democrat, two for Republican, or non-numeric, such as using red versus blue as colors, or using pictures like a donkey or an elephant, or codes or letters. The nominal data could be anything that indicates belongingness to a group. So these three blocks represent nominal data. We can tell that the blocks are distinct. They're different from each other. And I could easily use numbers to represent groups one, two, and three. Belongingness to group one or two or three might be dependent upon random selection. You signed up for an experiment and you were randomly put into group three. The key here is that you can belong in only one group. So you were in the third group, which means you could not be in the second or the first group. The groups are independent. But instead of indicating group belonging with numbers, I could just as easily use letters for groups A, B, and C. These were the groups that were originally one, two, and three, and it would be very easy to convert in our statistics software, make A equals one, B equal two, and C equal three. And because the indicator really doesn't have any meaning other than showing us a difference or group belonging, I could use colors like the red group, the blue group, and the orange group. The colors indicate exactly the same thing as the numbers or the letters. Or I could use complete words like the experimental versus the control group. Or I could code my data set to indicate the scores belonging to males or females. In many data sets, we will encounter the number zero. But with nominal data, the number zero doesn't have any specific meaning. It's just a point, it's not a label. It doesn't indicate absence. Typically, it indicates the group that is being compared. So for instance, this might be my control group. This is the low drug dose group, and this is the high drug dose group. The zero helps me remember which group was the control group. And because there is no underlying order, the numbers are not comparable. I can't look at your jersey number and my jersey number and say because your number is higher, you must be a better player. This is Jim Otto, who famously wore the number double zero for the Oakland Raiders. Well, double zero, does that mean that he was like a terrible player? What could be worse than double zero? Well, the answer is he was a Hall of Fame player. He was an excellent player. The double zero just stood in as a name. It did not indicate anything about playing ability. We cannot compare numbers in a nominal scale. And because there is no underlying order, we could rearrange the groups and it wouldn't matter as long as we keep track of which group has been labeled A, B, and C. Nominal data are categorical data. They indicate a difference, but nothing else. Typically, they indicate some kind of group belonging, especially when those numbers are used in a statistical data set. 
And when we use statistical software, you will often see the symbol for nominal data as being the three balls. The order doesn't matter. All we know is that the values are different from each other. There's a second type of categorical data that are called ordinal. Now, like nominal data, ordinal data tell us differences. But the ordinal data come with some kind of underlying order. Therefore, we can make some comparisons within, but not between. Here we have some ordinal data that's first, second, and third place. You could think of a, an Olympic medal platform for first, second, and third place. The numbers convey an order. Their ranks convey a difference. We could use numeric values in answer options, such as 1 equals disagree, 2 equals neutral, and 3 equals agree. But we could also use non-numeric symbols to represent our ordinal data, such as triple A to F credit ratings, or complete words, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Like with nominal data, we could represent our ordinal data with letters instead of numbers. Ordinal data are comparable within, but not between. The first place finisher in the race was the fastest runner. Second place was second fastest. You can compare within the rankings. The valedictorian in your graduating class was the student with the highest GPA. But you cannot compare between scales. Each time the race is run, there is a first, second, and third place finisher. But that doesn't mean that the first place finisher from this year was faster than the first place runner from this year, or that the valedictorian from this year is smarter than the valedictorian from last year. The order within will remain the same, but we cannot compare between these data sets. And unlike nominal data, Ordinal data do not have a zero point. There is no zero place in a finishing in a race. Both nominal and ordinal data are categorical. The nominal data are different, and the differences between the groups just indicates a category of belonging. With ordinal data, however, there is difference and an underlying order. And notice that this order is connected. We can't reorder. Now you may recall with nominal level data, we could rearrange the order of the categories and it really didn't matter. This group could be group three just as easily as this one or this one. However, with ordinal level data, it doesn't make sense to make this group three. This has to be group one, group two, and group three. We must maintain the order of the data. Both nominal and ordinal data are categorical. They tell us differences, and ordinal tells us difference and amount. But there's a different type of data that can answer questions like how many and how much. These data quantify. So let's talk first about interval level data. Interval level data have a scale, with equal intervals in the data, such that a 10-point difference is the same anywhere along the scale. It reflects a relative amount of difference. You see, with interval-level data, like Fahrenheit or Celsius, more doesn't indicate better. Would you rather be studying in a room that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 40 degrees Fahrenheit? More degrees doesn't equal more comfort. That comfort level is right in the middle. That's what I mean by a relative amount. Because of the underlying scale, interval level data are comparable both within and between scales. So for instance, if I measure something with a tape measure, I will get exactly the same results as if I had measured it using a yardstick. I can compare within and between. A five inch difference is the same anywhere along this scale or along the same scale as is measured with a metal tape measure. So let me illustrate for you what I mean by equal intervals all along the scale. 
Uh, I like to do woodworking. I have a small woodworking shop, and uh, my dad has access to that shop as well. When I was a kid, I know I broke stuff. And now that I have a shop, my dad is returning the favor for me. Like, for instance, with this tape measure, he was using the table saw and somehow managed to just rip the end off of this tape measure. At this point, I quit using the tape measure in the shop because I thought it was broken and unusable. But if I was in a pinch, if I needed to measure a board at 12 inches, could I still use this tape measure? Sure. And what would I do? Maybe instead of starting from the non-existing end, I would just go from one foot to two feet. This interval is exactly the same as from zero to one, as would be from two to three. 12 inches is exactly the same anywhere along this scale. That's what I mean by equal intervals. Interval level data may have a zero point, but they don't have to have a zero point. For instance, an IQ scale doesn't really have a zero. There's no such thing as having zero IQ regardless of what you may think. And because the zero point doesn't mean anything in particular, an interval level scale can have negative values. For instance, measuring temperature with Celsius or Fahrenheit will allow for negative degrees. It could be 12 degrees below zero on either scale. Notice that Celsius and Fahrenheit are comparable between scales. Anytime you have a reading in Celsius, it could be directly converted to a reading in Fahrenheit, comparable between those two scales. Interval level data are always numeric. We cannot calculate the mean of letters or do other analyses with colors. We must have numeric data in an interval scale. And interval level data are always continuous data, meaning that they're giving us some kind of count. They can answer the questions like how many and how much. Well, there's another type of data that can answer those same questions, that can do that same job. But there is one difference between interval and ratio level data, and that difference is the presence of the absolute zero. Ratio data have a scale with equal intervals that measures the true amount of differences, which means that zero must indicate a complete absence of the thing that we are measuring. Can you think of a measurement scale that has an absolute zero? What about with temperature? The measure of temperature that has an absolute zero is called Kelvin. You cannot have a value less than zero on a Kelvin scale. Absolute zero represents the absence of molecular motion. But there are other more common measures like height or weight. If we start with this surface being our starting point, and then we could use our yardstick to measure height. This surface is always zero. There is a continuous constant starting point that indicates zero and then all the numbers come up from here. We cannot have any negative values. We cannot have a value that goes below zero with this ratio scale. Like interval level data, ratio data have consistent intervals. 100 is twice as much as 50. Both ratio data with their absolute zero and interval data that do not have an absolute zero are continuous data. It is the underlying scale that allows us to do measurement and compare both within and between scales. Using interval and ratio level data is the most desirable type of data in a data set. It means that we are truly measuring something. And because interval and ratio level data both do the same job, quantifying, we're going to call both of them by the same name both interval and ratio level data will be called scale data. Therefore, we have nominal data, which indicates a difference, ordinal data, which indicate difference and order, and then interval or ratio level data, which indicate difference, order, and 
the magnitude of the difference. So these quantify, whereas these create categories. One other important clarification that I want to make between categorical and continuous data. Let's say that we are asking individuals about their age. And I ask, are you in the age category of 21 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49? I now have categorical data. I know which group you belong in. I know those groups are different. I know there is an underlying order. But I don't know your specific score. If I wanted to calculate the mean of those data, it would be very difficult to do because I don't have individual scores. If, on the other hand, I ask you, what is your age? I now have continuous data. Now I can use a mean and a standard deviation and all the other forms of analyses that are available. So when you have the option, it's always better to go with scale level data than categorical data, especially if you plan to do analysis or hypothesis testing. I am going to show you one thing that we can do with scale data, however, and that is convert it to categorical data. This is called binning. We create a bin in which we take a scale and we separate our scale. So now we have an age range which is broken down into 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49. We still can't go backwards, but if we have scale level data, we can create those categorical bins if we choose to. We will be using these levels of measurement consistently throughout this course. So it is very important that you are able to distinguish between nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio level data. In fact, I think this deserves further review.